Hi guys, it's Kate, and this is a video for Math 21A, making sense of quadric surfaces. How do we look at the general forms of these? What do the traces look like in X, Y, and Z? And what do the composite surfaces look like and what are their names? These really focus on the more advanced quadrics that we study in Math 21A. And it's important to have a few things top of mind. What are their traces? What shapes are their traces? What terms are quadratic terms? And what terms are linear terms? And using that as a guide to remember what their names are is really, really helpful. So let's get started. Our first one looks something like this. Here we have an equation with two variables in the quadratic terms and one variable in the linear term. They're on opposite side of the equal sign and the two quadratic terms are clustered together and they each have opposite signs. This is really important for what the traces end up being. Let's start looking at the traces in x. By looking at the shape of the traces in x, which appear in the yz plane, we find that we have downward facing parabolas. We have z on the right-hand side of the equal sign, and then we have negative y squared over b squared. Note that a, b, and c here are constants. They will be in each of the equations for the quadrics that we're discussing. And then we have this big constant here, k squared over a squared. So what we're looking at is downward-facing parabolas. Let's move on to traces in y. Now recall that I mentioned that this opposite sign on the quadratic terms is going to come in handy here. Again, we find that we have parabolas, but note that the quadratic term with a variable is now positive instead of negative, minus a constant, so we have upward facing parabolas for traces in y. Last, we take a look at the traces in z. Note that these take on the form of hyperbolas. And they could be north-south hyperbolas or east-west hyperbolas, depending on the value for k. Note that if k is positive, the x component is going to be larger than the y component. That means that if k is positive, we're dealing with east-west hyperbolas. If k happens to be negative, that means that the y component happens to be larger than the x component, and we're dealing with north-south hyperbolas. If k is 0, then x and y both must be 0. What kind of quadric surface is this? Well, putting it all together, here's what we have. Here we have what we call a hyperbolic paraboloid. Note that the traces that appear twice, the parabolas take over the noun part of the name, and the traces that appear once, the hyperbolas, take over the adjective part of the name. As you can see from this drawing, we have the downward facing parabolas in the red traces, the upward facing parabolas are the blue traces, and the north-south and east-west hyperbolas are the yellow traces. Let's move along. Here's the next basic formula for a quadric surface. Let's take a look at the traces in x first. This is pretty interesting. When we plug in k for x, we have k squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared plus c squared over c squared equals 1. If we pull that constant term now over to the right-hand side, we see that this is a circle of a particular radius. But note that y squared over b squared and z squared over c squared both have to be positive terms, so we have to be careful with this right-hand side. If this is anything positive, this will be an ellipse. If this right-hand side happens to be 0, y and z both have to be 0 they'll generate a point. If this right-hand side, depending on the choice of k, becomes negative, then there is no solution over here. So there are three possibilities, ellipses, a point, or nothing. When we take a look at the traces in y, we get the exact same thing. And we note that, in fact, the same thing is going to happen for traces in z as well. What does this look like? Well, altogether, this is an ellipsoid. Here's what an ellipsoid, or an egg-shaped object, looks like with all three traces in it. All are families of traces, and as k gets larger and larger and larger, eventually the traces go to a point, and then they stop existing altogether. That's when you're outside the ellipsoid for each of these. 
Our next quadric looks very similar to our first. We have two quadratic terms and one linear term, but note there's one important difference. The two quadratic terms have the same sign on the same side of the equal sign, while the linear term is isolated on the other side of the equal sign. Let's see how this affects the traces. We start with traces in x. When we take a look at the traces in x, we see that in the yz plane, we have parabolas. They're upward facing because the quadratic term over here is positive in sign. Taking a look at the traces in y, we see we again have upward facing parabolas. The quadratic term on the opposite side of the equal sign, this is now in the xc plane, is positive, leaving us with upward facing parabolas. Note that this is the major difference between our first quadric, which had quadratic terms of opposite sign on the same side of the equal sign, where we had downward and upward facing parabolas. Now, because both are the same sign, the direction of the parabola's opening is the same. Our final set of traces is in Z. Here we see that our traces are ellipses. Their radius depends on K. Note that if k is 0, x and y are both 0, so we have a point. If k is positive, we're dealing with ellipses, and if k is negative, we actually have no traces at all. So with this particular setup, we are dealing with only positive values for z. What is this quadric? Well, similar to before, the traces that appear twice, the parabolas, provide us with a noun, a paraboloid, and the trace that appears once, the ellipse, provides us with the adjective. An elliptic paraboloid is the answer. Taking a look at this quadric surface, we see the upward facing parabolas in the traces in x, as well as the traces in y. And last, we see the traces in z, the ellipses, in yellow. Moving on. We're moving right along. Let's take a look at this one. Every single term is a quadratic term. Two are negative, one is positive, and there's a constant that is non-zero on the other side of the equal sign. Let's start with our traces in x. Note that we always have something positive on this side of the equation, and so that means that this is going to be a hyperbola. When we're looking at the yz plane, that means that we have north-south hyperbolas. Moving right on, to traces in y. We have the exact same occurrence, more north-south hyperbolas. Finally, we want to look at traces in z. Note that I've algebraically rearranged this so that it's clear that these are going to be ellipses most of the time. That most of the time means that the value for k needs to be large enough so that k squared over c squared minus 1 is at least 0. If it's 0, then we have points. If it's greater than zero, then we have ellipses. If it's less than zero, then we have nothing. And it takes a while for k to grow large enough before it becomes large enough so that we have a point or an ellipse. So for low values of k, or for low values of z, regardless of sign, we're not going to have any part of our surface. What is this surface? It is called a hyperboloid of two sheets, and here's what it looks like. Here you can see the two sets of north-south hyperbolas in x and y in red and blue, and then the two sets of ellipses in yellow. We specifically discussed the idea that the traces in z depend on the value for z. Sometimes they're ellipses, sometimes they come to a point, sometimes the function isn't even defined at those particular values of z. And we see that happening here. The ellipses happen down here, where z's magnitude is quite high, regardless of sign and then they come to a point right here, and then here is that area where z just isn't quite large enough in magnitude in order for the function to have uh, defined points in the domain there. Our fifth quadric happens to be one where, again, we have all quadratic terms, but note that our constant that's added on is zero. One of the terms is on one side of the equal sign, and the other two are on the other side, and note that all three terms are positive here. Let's take a look at the traces in x. Note that these are hyperbolas, sort of. It depends on the value for k. If k is positive or negative, then these are going to be hyperbolas. 
they're going to be north-south hyperbolas. But if k is 0, these will be absolute value lines. Let's take a look at traces in y. Note that the same thing is happening. These traces are either north-south hyperbolas or absolute value lines as well, depending on the value for k. And last but not least, let's take a look at the traces in z. These happen to be ellipses for k greater than 0, and then it comes to a point at k equals 0. What is this composite surface? It's going to be a cone. Here we can see both sets of north-south hyperbolas, and at k equals 0, we can see that absolute value line creating that hard edge that cones are known for. And then in the z traces, we can also see these ellipses. Our final quadric is next. All right, this is our final quadric surface. We have all quadratic terms on one side of the equation. Two are of one sign, one is of the other. And then we also have a constant term on the opposite side that is non-zero. Let's analyze the traces, starting with in x. Our traces here are hyperbolas. Note that the hyperbolas depend on the value for k. When k assumes values so that the right-hand side of this equation is positive, that means that we have east-west hyperbolas. When the right-hand side of the equation is 0, we have lines. And when the right-hand side of the equation is negative, that means we have north-south hyperbolas. This is with respect to the yz plane, of course. Let's take a look at the traces in y. The exact same thing is happening again. Now, I've moved the term involving y, which is now a constant, onto the right-hand side. And depending on the sign of the right-hand side, it may be north-south hyperbolas, east-west hyperbolas, or lines, again, exactly the same as with x. Last but not least, we want to take a look at the traces in z. If we move that component that involves z over to the right-hand side, we end up with a right-hand side that will always be positive. And seeing the two quadratic terms on the left-hand side, summed together, both positive, means that we have ellipses throughout all of our traces in z. What does this look like? Well, this is a hyperboloid of one sheet. It's really important to see all the different shapes that are happening in this hyperboloid of one sheet. Most easily, you can see the ellipses, the traces in z in yellow right here. Then if we look at the traces in x, which happen to be the hyperbolas, we see that along x equals 0, we have these east-west hyperbolas. Then as x increases, we have these lines. Then they switch to north-south hyperbolas as x continues to increase. The same thing is happening as y increases. This is sort of where y equals 0, so I drew a straight line here. Then we have where y equals 1, which is going to give the straight lines, which go down here and then cross over, sort of anchor back here behind where I've drawn this. So you see one straight line here and one straight line here, similarly here and here. And then we have the north-south hyperbolas in either direction. Together, these are the three families of traces that create a hyperboloid of one sheet. As you're going over these, Make sure you understand how many quadratic and linear terms you have, whether their signs are the same or different, and whether a constant is involved, and if that's zero or non-zero as a result.